because you wasn't the player that was out there putting up the numbers that right. I was putting up. Right. You wasn't the player that was the best on the team with the Yankees, with the uh, Braves, mm -hmm. with the Marlins. Every place I played, I was the best on the team. Yeah. And if you don't want to believe that, because of the faces on that team, right, right. do your homework. Today on Show and Go with X, we have Gary Sheffield. He breaks down his last year of Hall of Fame candidacy on the ballot. We also talk about the narrative that's been painted around him throughout the course of his career. And finally, that infamous swing of his, so sweet. Show and Go starts now. Chef, man, uh, appreciate you coming through, uh, show and go. But I think I want to start right away talking about this Hall of Fame stuff, mm -hmm. right? Like, let's get this out of the way. What's been, last year on the ballot, the writer's ballot, Right. what's been the greatest part about the nomination in general, just off the jump? Just knowing where you started, and now we're at this point, and my name is mentioned in that on that list. Mm -hmm. uh, and saying to yourself, you know, the journey that it took to get here, mm. just to be on the list is an honor itself. Yeah. And to know that where your place in history, I'm in the 20s, the top 20 in pretty much everything. And so when I look back at it, because I never really took time to reflect mm. on my career because of the Hall of Fame right. and because I don't want to do it until it is all over, mm. whether I get in or not, I then I would reflect. But, you know, looking at my journey to get there, being on the list, mm -hmm. that's an honor that's, yeah. that you can't describe. <laughs> <laughs> I, I get the opportunity to reflect because I don't want to get too fanboy, but you was one of my favorite players, you, you and Tony Gwynn. Mm -hmm. And I think watching the way you attack the baseball um, was different than everybody else. Right. But also you had great plate discipline. You yeah. understood how guys were going to attack you. And I think for me, that's what I always wanted in my game is – I want to be aggressive, but I want to be smart with my decision making. Right. And I think that's one of the reasons why your numbers are Hall of Fame numbers. Right. They are Hall of Fame numbers. Well, get that straight. Let's get that straight <laughs> out of the way. Um, but last year on the ballot, what are the emotions that come along with knowing it's the last year? Is it is there anxiousness? Is there nervousness? Is it is it calm? What what is it like? going through it on a day-to-day -day basis, knowing that this may be the la is the last year in the writer's ballot? Well, for me, you know, I've been through so much in my life, you can't, it's hard to pretty much get me rattled mm. because I've learned over time, you know, I can't control certain things. Right. And I'm a guy that, I'm, I'm a perfectionist. I like to have everything perfect set over here, sit this over here. Mm. And I had to learn how to be patient and say, let the process take its course. Mm. Because I'm thinking, in my mind, then the people that, that, that vote on this thing, they're gonna do their homework, mm -hmm. and they're gonna do the right thing at the end of the day. Now, if they don't, they're humans. They're humans at the end of the day. Humans make errors. Mm -hmm. And so the bottom line is if, that I, I challenge everybody is to do your homework. Mm -hmm. Because see, what the perception is, it may not be the reality. Because right. see, if you get to know people, and really talk to people, you'll really get to understand why they're the way they are. Hmm. And so for me, I don't get worked up over first year. Now, I will say the first year that was exciting mm -hmm. because it was it just happened. Right, right. But over time, especially my last year, it does nothing to me, mm -hmm. to be honest with you. The, mm -hmm. What I what I'm thankful for though, and all of it, um, that kind of soothed me a little bit, um, is that writers is finally some writers are finally <laughs> doing their homework you know because yeah. it's right in front of you now right. i have it on my phone the facts to it right all. you know the what the, the you know the whole scenario and so when when I, when I have that and i have the numbers and mm. my pedigree included i, I don't worry about it, it it speaks for itself yes for me right like yeah. and i think that's the cool thing about being someone that's that's played after you is like some of the numbers that we're looking at now, got some of your numbers, guys aren't going to be touching right. at all at right. some point. So 
I think that's the one of the coolest things for me to see. And then you touched on the writers having to do their homework. Some yeah. of the guys really diving in more, maybe because of that last year. And I yeah. think we saw a recent article, Bob Nightingale, USA Today, wrote a great article. Mm -hmm. And he did his homework. Did his homework. What what is are your thoughts when you think about somebody that's or the perception that maybe you've had people from people that haven't done their homework? Mm -hmm. Like what what does that make you feel like, or how do you feel that there are people that are afraid to do their homework or don't want yeah. to do their homework? Well, then then it takes me back to where I was raised. I was raised in the South. Mm -hmm. See, when you're raised in the South and you know what I'm talking about. Break it down. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so so it's like, that's what I started thinking about. Yeah. And so I don't want to think that way. Right. But right. the facts are the facts. Right. You know, I, I we went, it was certain places we couldn't go around here. Mm -hmm. And there was certain things we couldn't do. And so was it fair? No, it right. was just the way it was. Mm -hmm. So now that's what basically they're telling me. Mm -hmm. uh, this is just the way it is. We get to control the narrative, yeah. whether we want you in or not. Well, who are you to want to want me in or not? <laughs> because you wasn't the player that was out there putting up the numbers that right. I was putting up. Right. You wasn't the player that was the best on the team with the Yankees, with the uh, Braves, mm -hmm. with the Marlins. Every place I played, I was the best on the team. Yeah. And if you don't want to believe that, because of the faces on that team. Right, right. Do your homework. Right. Let, let me ask you something about an argument that people have thrown out there, which I don't think makes a lot of sense, because if you a Hall of Famer, it don't matter what teams you played right, for, right. Your, your numbers are your numbers. Right. And it could mean more if you played for more teams. But, but I feel like the one of the arguments is not long enough with one team. Mm -hmm. What What is... What is your thoughts about that? Because I, that's something that I feel like, man, I'm, I wish that wasn't an argument. Well, it's the dumbest thing I ever heard <laughs> because you know, Ricky Henderson played on just as many. Mm -hmm. You know, so, you know, when you look at that, they're not looking. Like I say, do your homework or why I'm, I was on Milwaukee. I got right. drafted there. Mm -hmm. Why did I go to San Diego? Because just like um, other Position players say I'm not moving my position. Mm -hmm. That's the pos that's the position I took. Right. I said I'm not moving from shortstop to play third base. Right. But I was only 19 years old saying that. Mm -hmm. So now I get crushed for it, and they force me to do it. Right. So now I'm out of position. Mm -hmm. I'm not a third baseman. I'm not an outfielder. I'm a shortstop. Right. So now when that happened, that's when the reputation started. Mm -hmm. So now when I get traded to San Diego Padres. I played third base because I had no choice because I got I was traded there. Right. But what did I go do? I almost won triple crown. Mm -hmm. I had 14 errors at third base. Ken Caminetti had 25 errors at third mm -hmm. base. Who get the gold glove? Ken Caminetti. <laughs> now I'm up for triple crown. Who gets the MVP vote? Barry Bonds. Who get in, who who comes in second? Terry Pendleton. How I come in third place? <laughs> at I'm, a, I'm triple crown on the last day of the season. Right. So why I leave San Diego? I can go on and on mm -hmm. because my production says my money and my pay go up. Is this worth? Yeah. My worth. So San Diego can't pay it. Mm -hmm. I go to Florida Marlins. I sign a four-year deal. Mm -hmm. I sign a seven-year deal. Didn't play one game on a seven-year deal. Why? We won a World Series. Nice. Yep. My, I could have stamped my, 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 my career there. Mm-hmm. But what happened? Can't afford it. Right. Got to go to L.A. Mm -hmm. Same thing in L.A. Not knowing who the ownership, the management was all screwed up. They offered me a lifetime deal. They sent me to Atlanta. What happened in Atlanta? Atlanta, they sold the team. Right. They didn't have an owner. So now I have to leave there. Mm -hmm. Now I said, okay, I'm going to go somewhere where they have money, mm -hmm. which is New York. Yankees, yeah. But what I do there? I should have won MVP in 2004. Three, three amazing right. years. Then the second year, I come in third place in MVP. Mm -hmm. But what happened? I get hurt. They they bring Bobby Abreu in mm -hmm. and pay him more than me to do less. And I said that. Right. So when I when I defend myself and Express I advocate yourself, for myself, right. yeah. then everybody got a problem with it. But they're not doing their homework to say, this is why he's on so many teams because mm -hmm. my production is better than everybody else's. Right. And, and you can make happens. the argument that everybody wanted you still. It yes. didn't matter, yes. you know, what yes. the situation may be. Absolutely. And I feel like 
sometimes that can be tougher as an athlete to have to, to, have to bounce to different places right. and still perform at the level that you did, a right. Hall of Fame level. Right. Um, and I, and I'm, I want to go back to your rookie year because eight, 18 mm -hmm. years old, yep. what was it like being an 18-year-old in the major leagues yeah. at, at a premier shortstop position? Because yeah. first of all, we don't see 18-year-olds make the major leagues, right, right? right? But then also manning a position like that and producing the way you have to. Well, it wasn't supposed to happen that way because they didn't want to call me up as a September call-up at 18 years mm -hmm. old. But my production in the minor leagues, nobody's ever been able to duplicate it. And you was only a year yeah. and a half out of high, high out school, of high school, right? yes. And so now the numbers that I put up, I, I, I just hit like 375 with 44 home runs and 140-something <laughs> RBI. Combined from double-A and triple-A, mm. then I got to the big leagues. I was just supposed to sit there on the bench because they didn't want to call me up mm -hmm. because I told them I was going to winter ball to mm. prove that I, I was ready for the big league. Hmm. They didn't want me to go there, so they called me up. Wow. Dale Swain just so happened to break his leg that same day. So I had to go in the game. So I wound up playing 20 games. Wow. And I, you know, and I, going out on the field, for me, it was supposed to be fun. Mm -hmm. It was supposed to be fun. Right. But what I what I've realized real quick that my, during my era of that time, mm -hmm. guys was jealous of younger players coming in and being the face mm. of an organization. And so I used to get it all kinds of ways. I used to get haze. I used to get my my if I buy a brand new suit to wear on the plane because I didn't have any. Yeah. They would cut my leg off in <laughs> one of the legs. All of these things took place. It was it was like pure hell, but. <laughs> I was trying to be a team player and right. not get upset about it. Right. But over time, it weighs on you because mm -hmm. it, 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 when your performance is not what you want it to be and all these other things are happening, mm -hmm. that ain't how I picture the big leagues. Right. And, and I see, you know, young players, obviously, it's more popular now, right? Yeah. Young players have more of a voice in the game yeah. today. They not being hazed. Right. Um, the situation seems more comfortable for them once they come into the game. And I even, I'll go back to my early days as a rookie. You still felt like you were tiptoeing around certain yeah. things and you didn't yeah. want to act a certain way. But now you got the young players, they, they rule in the clubhouse. Yeah. They playing the music. Yeah. They doing all this stuff. So it's definitely different nowadays. But I want to ask you, along that Hall of Fame journey, mm -hmm. um, who were some of the mentors for you? Because I I'm assuming that there had to be people that at least gave you little things to keep you on the right track and keep yeah. you focused on what you needed to do. Yeah, I mean, that's that's an easy one. You know, Pops, Dave Parker, he was mm -hmm. like my 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 lifeline. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, Don Baylor, mm -hmm. Kirby Puckett. Uh, Dave Winfield, mm -hmm. I always seek the veterans. Mm -hmm. And and in Milwaukee, the, the best thing that happened to me was, was the, um, the, them hiring uh, Don Baylor as the hitting coach mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. bringing in Dave Parker to be a DH first baseman wow. and that mentor to me and get me to understand how to prepare for a 162-game season, mm -hmm. how to get your rest, how to take care of your feet. Mm -hmm. I never had a pedicure in my life, you know what I mean, until I met Dave Parker. And I didn't understand why. Right. But, you know, he, he always believed in if you take care of your feet, they'll take care of you. Right. And so I've always took little bits and pieces of what they, they taught me and told me and then just carried it on to 22 years. Mm. The, the, the feet thing actually <laughs> no, it resonates with me because yeah. I've had plantar fasciitis. Yeah. I understand how your feet are your foundation yep. of everything, everything. And people don't realize you live in... 40 years in, in, in cleats that yeah. are squishing your feet. Like yeah. you have to, you have to take care of yourself. Yeah. I think that's in, important to mention. Yeah. Um, I guess amongst those people, obviously you came up, Doc Gooden was somebody that was important right. for you. What right. was that relationship like? Because we understand that was something that was, uh, seemed to be a tight knit relationship, yes. even all the way through the big leagues. Yeah, uh, that that's the part that helped groom me into the man I became, mm. because you know, being four years younger than him, he was this iconic figure from the age of eleven. Mm. And so, like, people don't understand how from good, eleven from eleven. <laughs> I mean, he had this bionic arm, you know, as a, as a teenager. And I mean, he broke his arm playing football, and when he came back from it, it was bionic. It was like this: the ball come out of it so fast, and I was the only one can catch him. Wow. So I had to to take the blunt of 
growing and dealing with all of these things that he was bringing like like you know back then that was 95 miles an hour mm. and i had to catch him and i didn't want to do it and uh you know i went through pure hell oh. had a, learning how to play <laughs> baseball with him because he was so good at it because he worked at it every day mm -hmm. and i was just gifted so i was this gifted athlete in football baseball anything i touched i knew how to play it yeah and he saw that early and he made me get up at seven in the morning every morning wow. and work with him. And and we're like brothers. We live together. That's my mom's little brother. Um, and when when I went through that test, hmm. I was prepared for any test. Wow. And I guess throughout the course of your career, there's always ups and downs, right? Yes. Um, I, I want to ask you, because I know for me, just playing, there becomes these high points where you, you feel like you're going great, nothing can stop you. Mm -hmm. And then there's these low points where you feel like, man, I don't feel like I, I'm myself right now. Right. Where there are certain points for you that you remember, okay, this is, this is an extreme high mm -hmm. and I love this, but also what was the lowest point for you? Yeah, well, people get this, this thing turned around and this, this notion been out there for years that I didn't care to elaborate on because I know that wasn't true. Mm. Um, yes, my time in Milwaukee was hard, but that's just part of life. Mm. Now, did I like Milwaukee? I love Milwaukee. Mm. I love being in the city. Hmm. I, 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 I had no problem with the city. It was the, the decisions that was made on my behalf hmm. which made my life hard because I was asked to move for a player that shouldn't even been in my conversation. Right. And that's no disrespect to him. That's a fact. Right. So now, over time, I make it that blunt about the move because it shouldn't have happened. Let me ask you. Let me ask you. How did? So, if there's people that are watching that don't really understand mm -hmm. how that situation evolved, someone asked you to move your position. You, I'm, I'm staying here. Yeah. Is that something that you were vocalizing in yes. the media, or how was that? How was that actually blowing, blowing up? I was too young to even know what the media was. Mm. I'm 18 years old, mm -hmm. 19 years old. The media that that when I was growing up, and they always covered the Pete Roses where I grew up in Al Lopez Field. Mm. I see Pete Rose, Dave Lopez, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, Joe Morgan, mm -hmm. all these Johnny Bench, all these guys. I have never seen anything written negative right. towards them. Huh. So my perception is when I went to the see the I said I went to see the Reds play, Pete Rose made an error at third base, and I was cheering you'll get it the next time. Hmm. I was rooting for him to get the next one. <laughs> Negative thoughts never crossed my mind. Right. So when I get to Milwaukee. It's almost like naive to, right. to people doing that. Right. So now I'm not understanding where the negativity coming from because I said and I got drafted at this position. Mm -hmm. And I performed at this position. And I've done things in the minor leagues that nobody's ever done. Right. So the thing is, is that you wanted me to cut my errors down. I did. I got to the big leagues. Mm. The guy that they wanted to put in my replacement and move me to third had more errors than I did. <laughs> so I didn't understand. Right. So like you said, naive. I'm just saying... It takes me back to my childhood of how I grew up. Right. You know, when I got white people making decisions, then it's going against me for another white player, mm -hmm. automatically, yeah. my thoughts right. goes there. Right. And you mentioned earlier that that's not where you want your thoughts to no, go, no, but, no. but naturally that's what happens. That's what happens. And yeah. I think, you know, that, that makes sense because of what you've seen in yeah. your past growing up. Yeah. Um, and, and I think... That's one thing as young players that I want players to understand that you cannot go along the journey thinking that everybody's on your side. Right. And I think right. that that's something that you experience. Mm -hmm. But what would you tell young players nowadays? Because there's a different we're in a different digital age in which right. people can write anything about you. They that's may right. not even be a writer. They may not be even in the media. They may have a blog or a tweet and write some negative stuff and it can go viral and people will believe it. Mm -hmm. What would you, is there advice that you would give young players today or how how should they handle certain things like that? Well, I had a long time to think about that, that question. That's a great question. 
And that's a meaningful question. I think that all kids should understand. And this is the most meaningful thing there is in the sport. But I think that where guys go wrong is that they try to be something else to get in the door, mm. to appease people, to make people feel comfortable. Right. Even if they're not being themselves. Huh. If you go into a situation being yourself, you don't have to go back and try to find who you was trying to be. Mm. And so I think that a lot of athletes, I watch it over and over and over. They come in and they're not being authentic. Mm. You know, they're being- You can tell off the- you, I, I, yeah. the, But see, I'm an observer. Mm -hmm. See, like, that's why I have so much information in my brain that sometimes I'll speak too fast because it's racing. <laughs> you are. <laughs> because it's like, I know what I know. Right. Because right. I'm an only child. Mm. And when you're an only child, you observe everything. Mm -hmm. And so you, you don't, I don't judge no one. I observe, I figure you out mm. without you even saying a word. Mm. And so now when I see a guy walk in the room and he's got this persona about him and then you see him overly happy or not saying nothing at all, hmm. I can kind of put that in its perspective based on the room. Hmm. So now when you see a guy overly excited all the time, there's some dark stuff going on in there mm. because they're putting on a front right. in front of the people, but when they go home, they're not happy with themselves. Right. So my advice is always go into a situation being your authentic self. Hmm. And, and I think we've all been around people that act yeah. a certain way and yeah. trying to uh, please certain people. Yeah. Um, and trying to do certain things. And I think, you know, what you mentioned is something that's even more important today because I think as young players or as players in general, as people in general, mm -hmm. our best self is going to give us success. Always. And I feel like, yeah. you know, it's hard nowadays because we see so much, and I think social media, so much information mm -hmm. out there that says we should live a certain way, right. like uh, certain pictures that, that this is how we should live if right. we're a big leaguer yeah. or if we're an athlete or if we should we should be going to the club doing this, yeah. this, and this. Yeah. And I think that's what's interesting about you too is there's there was a certain narrative about you that that people don't realize you you didn't do no smoking, no weed, no drugs, none of, none that. of that stuff. No. And and I think what how, how what, first of all I ask you what allowed you to stay on the right path to right. where you knew what you needed to do. And why do you think those narratives sometimes come out about, about guys, including yourself? Well, unfortunately, being an African-American and growing up in the hood, mm. you see a lot of things. Your friends, your neighborhood becomes your association. Right. So with that being said, my neighborhood is the, whatever these guys are doing mm. illegally. They or, assuming you doing they it. They assume I'm doing it but I'm learning from them what mm. not to do. Mm. If there are some kids, you can lose kids in that, in that, that pack, mm -hmm. or some kids gonna, like me, are gonna, are gonna look at it and say, no, I'm not doing that, I want something better. Mm. So I, I was that kid, always the only child. My mom and dad always made sure that I was home by a certain time, mm. I was only allowed to play, a certain amount of time. I had to study a certain amount of time. Hmm. And my 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 life was organized. Mm. And so that formed me to be an organized person. Hmm. So when I see my uncle firsthand, you know, doing things and, and I'm covering for him and then I get in trouble for it hmm. and then I have to tell the truth. So I realized then telling the truth is the way. Hmm. You know, I'm not going to be a liar. Right. I'm not going to be one of these shady persons. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be a person that loses friends because he was shady or right. this and that. Right. I'd rather lose a friend being real with him mm -hmm. than anything else. And so that kind of like formed my life and going forward of how I wanted to be because I saw enough negativity and downfalls and what drugs make you look like, hmm. what it make you act like, and I ain't want no part of it. Right. And I think that's one of the reasons why I wanted to bring you on because I appreciate how open you are just having conversations mm -hmm. before hearing the truth come out of your mouth and how, how easy it is for you to talk about certain things. Mm -hmm. um, 
I want to ask you a little bit about what people don't have the truth on, right? right, and, right. and just your association with performing enhancing drugs. Yeah. And not necessarily, we don't need to know the history and all mm -hmm. that, but like what what is important for people to know about what you went through along your journey and why people shouldn't assume about <laughs> certain things yeah. associated with you? You know, once you get put in that category, now the people that's really guilty of that, mm -hmm. what they say, then basically for me, knowing that I'm not, I shouldn't even be in this category, mm -hmm. there's nothing for me to say. Yeah. Because if I sound like them, I'm them. Right. You see? Right. You're saying there's no reason to try to defend myself because then I, sound I just like sound them. like somebody that actually is using performing and yes. drugs. I know for a fact it's guys in the Hall of Fame right now that's, right. that's done it. They've been, they've been found guilty of it, but they're in it. But see, these are the things, it goes, like, it goes back to everything I've always said. When it comes to me, if you really did your homework and you say, during the trial, mm -hmm. the Barry Bonds trial, mm -hmm. was I a suspect or a witness? I was a witness. Mm -hmm. So I went in to, they had me to come in to testify right. against Barry Bonds. Right, right. I didn't see Barry Bonds do anything illegal. Mm -hmm. And if I had seen that, I'd have been going immediately. Right. But I, had, I didn't see it. Mm -hmm. So now I'm a witness coming in to testify. Right. That's what I did. Mm -hmm. Now, when you, so, when you talk about that, there's two things. There's Congress and there's the Mitchell Report. Right. Why wasn't I at, at, at the Congress thing? Because I wasn't a suspect. Mm -hmm. Okay? Why I'm in the Mitchell Report? Because he took what somebody says and no facts behind it. Because if I'm a witness, how can I be involved? Mm -hmm. So otherwise, assuming... Otherwise, I'll be involved. Right. Now, when... when uh, they put me in the Mitchell Report. I remember playing for the Detroit Tigers. Jim Leland, David Dabrowski called me in the office mm -hmm. and said, Major League Baseball hired this guy, Mitchell. Mm -hmm. And I said, who is that? And they said, well, he wants to talk to you. I was like, great. <laughs> because now I could tell can, my story. Yeah, get the truth. Right. right. Now the truth will be in your book, opposed to put me in your mm -hmm. book when you never even talk to me. You never even spoke to me. I don't even know who this man is. Hmm. So the question that I've, I wrestle with is how can I be a, 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 a witness in a case in a, in a, yeah. and then a turn around to be a suspect <laughs> over steroids? Right. And then how can I be in your book mm. when you didn't talk to me? Right. So I've never seen a person that's a witness go to jail for a crime that they was going there to <laughs> testify against. That's an excellent point. I mean, that's an excellent point. And Never now we've it. had people even back up yeah. kind of the story, people that have been involved and have backed you up too. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm hoping that's something people really dive into. I, I guess so something that you mentioned about guys that had taken performance enhancing drugs that are in the Hall of Fame now. Um, to me, that would be something that I, I would be emotional over. I would be like, wait a minute, that, there's something not right about that. Mm -hmm. and, and I may want to even say names and whatnot, yeah. but, but for you, what emotions come along with knowing there's guys that, that went the wrong direction and you did things the right way mm -hmm. and seeing what the outcome has been now? Mm -hmm. I know what it is. See, when you know what it is, it is what it is. <laughs> and so that's how I look at life. <laughs> That might be my new favorite yeah, quote. <laughs> because think about it. When you know what it is, it is what it is. That's it. Because the thing is, is that why did they never? Why did they ever vote for me in the whole uh, the MVP? I can I can reel off each person that was voted ahead of me, and I can reel off my numbers. And there's no way you can come no, to that no conclusion. argument. No argument. Yeah. Because see, what you do in your performance, whether you hit thirty or forty home runs, mm -hmm. but what I do in my performance. I make everybody better. Mm. Not only that, I have to do it with 130 and 140 and 160 walks. Mm. So you know the game. Yeah. When I have 160 walks and you have 85, mm -hmm. there's a difference. Different impact, different on, impact on the team. That's 100%. Right. So 
Nobody wants to talk about that. Nobody <laughs> wants to put that in consideration. Mm. That's why guys like Frank Thomas and guys like that's who I yes. I respect as yeah. baseball players. Right. Barry Bonds is and guys that that walk right. and still put up the numbers that these guys that they try to turn into iconic figures who never won a championship, never mm. done anything right. on that level. Yeah. And they want to make them iconic figures. And then, and, 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 and when you look at this stuff, that's why I keep everything in perspective and I stay so calm with things because mm. I can't be rattled. Yeah. Because I know it is what it is. And I think that's, man, that's what I appreciate because yeah. you've gone through a journey in which yeah. you shouldn't have, you sh honestly <laughs> shouldn't have had to. No, I shouldn't. I shouldn't. But, 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 but I think, but I think yeah. people are starting to realize that. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping that you know, the right, the right results come out of that too. It, it will over time, you know, mm -hmm. like I said, and, and this, this can be the year, it can be whatever. But at right. the end of the day, like, like when, since we're talking about that, my most disappointing feeling comes from the players that played with me mm. that I helped raise Yeah, because I didn't want them to go through what I went through in Milwaukee. Right. And I gave them the first class treatment. I mm. bought them suits, I bought them shoes. I, I, I fed them, right. I let them live in my house, I let mm. them, I, I put them up, I fund everything. Right. I made sure they had, they didn't deal with none of the stuff I dealt with. Wow. And when I see them get on TV and another player come out of their mouth and no mention of me, <laughs> that's the most disappointing thing to me ever. Jeez. Because if you felt uncomfortable going to bat for me, right. Won't you call me and I can break down everything along the way so you can take the information I gave to you, put it on TV, and put the facts out there. Well, the reason why they wouldn't come to you is because they know they're wrong, right? Yeah. They, they're wrong for yeah. that in the first place. Well, that's that's the point. So now those are the people that I'm talking about. Mm. They have to go find who they really are. Right. Because, see, I thought as a young player, I was raised as some old, you know, from an old G to a young G. Right. I'm raising these guys yeah. the right way. Yeah. Now I see that I must have dropped the ball. No, I don't think that was, I don't think that was the case. Um, especially if you going out your way doing what, what a young player would 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 want, right? Somebody yeah. to take them under their wing, and yeah. there was guys that took me under my wing, and and. You know, and or I was under their wing, and I was able to see kind of the right way to go about things and mm -hmm. and learn from them. And I think those things are so monumental. But I think people sometimes lose track. What's that word you said, monumental? Mm -hmm. Because when I was when they when that was when that happened to me, all the people that I just mentioned to you, mm -hmm. including some, I still reach out to this day. And even when I was playing hmm. at the top of my game, making the most money. I was reaching out to those guys, hmm. making sure they was good. If they needed something from me, thank God they didn't yeah. because they're doing well. Right. But that was my mission because right. I'm always going to take care of those guys. Yeah. And so that's something that my generation, we had to do. Mm -hmm. If I came into a city, Kirby Puckett had to take me out the first night. Yeah. Then he comes in my city, I have to take him out the first night. Then you're on your own the next two days because some people are married. Right. So right. we got to go out and have a drink, get to know each other. Yeah. That's how we bonded. Right. right. So now, as I got older, guys start pulling away from that. Mm -hmm. So now you're really not bonding with guys yeah. that you should be raising up. And so that's why the game is at an all time low in percentage of us. That's that's a whole nother podcast, too. Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, to talk about just because I think we have this mentality nowadays. And, and when I say we, mm -hmm. I, I can say African-Americans, yes. right? We're yeah. black. We have this mentality that is is sometimes it's me versus everybody else, right? right? And we right. got to get ours. And I right. think what you're talking about is more of a mentality of, yo, let me let me help you. Yes. Let, let me help you. Let me help you. And mm -hmm. we all win. That's not being racist. Mm -hmm. See, that's, that's, the, that's what these guys are missing. Mm -hmm. It's not being racist. Yes. Races is taking care of your own. Right, right. And right. what I mean by seeing somebody else that struggling. look like you, exactly. So if I look, you look like me, then I'm going to help you. Right. So now, when when you get older, you can help somebody else. Right. So when that gets lost, we're in trouble. Yeah. So that's what we try to prevent. Right. But that's what's happening now, mm -hmm. and the guys that's playing now don't see the benefit in it mm. because it wasn't about it wasn't about me. Was I performing well? 
or I was or, or I was playing uh, good or bad. Mm -hmm. It was about I was fulfilling my obligation. Something bigger, something bigger, bigger than you on the field. Than you on the field, and and that's what it comes from. And 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 it builds character, and it builds a friendship and a relationship that you think that can't be broken. Yeah, and I think that relationship aspect of baseball is is almost not talked about enough yeah, because yeah. that's what really defines who we are inside the game and then yeah. even after the game, right? right. Being able to have though that communication skills, right. Right. being able to talk with other guys. And I think what you're saying too, and, and I love how you mentioned that's not being racist because you can help you, someone that looks like you and you can help somebody that looks yes. not like you, right? right? So, because that's what you're in the business of help. So just like CC Sabathia, I, I played for the Yankees. Mm -hmm. And he was coming to the Yankees. I had to move on uh, to the Tigers. And he asked me, he called me, and um, he wanted to talk about the Yankee situation. Should he go or should he go somewhere else? Mm. Now, that's part of being able to reach out to your, to your own yeah. for help. Right. So anything I can do for CC, that's what I did. I basically explained to him my situation. Right. But I explained to him New York situation, mm. how they would treat you. Mm -hmm. See, what I went through, you don't have to go through, but what's there, embrace it. Yeah, you're gonna so, give him the information. I'm gonna give him the information. So now, what I did, I was only second in MVP, should have won. I was only third in MVP, should have been in second. Mm -hmm. And then I got hurt. And then I was never allowed to win my job back. Mm. So once you're in a situation like that, if that would have happened to you, what would you say? You probably would say, you know, this ain't right. Yeah. I perform right. and I get hurt and now I can't go win my job back. Right. You give it away. That tells you they want to do that in the first place. Mm. They was waiting on my downfall to give it away. Mm. So I get so this is why I played for 22 years and I played the way I did, is because I knew. If I didn't play well, it was going to be he's he's finished. Mm -hmm. And then when I played well, he's trade bait. So why wouldn't I be on eight different teams? Right, right. Well, <laughs> I mean, let me oh, let, let me ask you something before I, I want to take you to the board and kind of talk about the numbers that that you like. But mm -hmm. uh, you just mentioned twenty two years. Mm -hmm. What allowed you to have that that longevity? Because mm -hmm. most guys don't have even half of that. So what allowed you to Mentally, physically, anything that kept you locked in there. Paying attention mm. and paying attention and looking at veterans, not about their performance, about how they prepare. I want to know what did you do when you when you when you first got to the park. Where did you go? Mm. I watch them go in the training room, get treatment. Mm. Then I watch them come out of the training room. They go to the cage. But they would stretch first. Mm -hmm. I'm young. I don't need to stretch. Mm -hmm. I could just walk in the park and start throwing the ball 90-something <laughs> miles an hour. So I'm looking at this, and yeah. I'm like, they do all this to get ready? Yeah. But it was a preparation going on. Mm -hmm. And once I saw the routine of the cage work, and then they do what everybody else do, mm -hmm. they were separating themselves from everybody else. And so I said, do you want to be just average or great? Mm -hmm. And always in my mind, average never been part of my conversation. Mm. And so I want to look at the best player, see how he prepare, and go out playing. Mm -hmm. So my teammates was my competition because I wanted to make sure you, I was better than all of you. Wow. And I think, I mean, hearing that, it, it resonates with me so much because it's like, the, the routine, the preparation, mm -hmm. all that stuff that almost don't have anything to do with actually you playing the actual game right. is what you you said, use the word separate. Right. That's the separator a lot of the times. And I think young athletes, athletes in the game, mm -hmm. even people in different professions are trying to figure out what's going to separate me from somebody else. Right. And you mentioned this, it's the, it's the preparation. It's the yeah. stuff beforehand yep. that gets you going. And that, yeah. that that's what I had to learn as a young player too was – Okay, what is so and so doing that that I should be doing? Mm -hmm. well, why is so and so running from this part of the clubhouse to the other part of the right. clubhouse? What am I missing out on? And right. I think that's what I want people to figure out for themselves: is you you have to figure out your own routine and right. what's going to bring the best out of you. Yeah, I mean, it just some guys 
shy away from greatness mm. because they don't want to deal with the responsibility. That's it's part of it. Yeah. Some guys want greatness but don't want to be bothered mm. because they don't want what comes with it. <laughs> so they 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 want greatness over here, but they ain't willing to do all of that. <laughs> And so they're creeping up the line and with being unnoticed. Right. And so those guys, wow. to me, they need people around them mm. to be that. See, a, a a player that's great and ain't scared of nothing, ain't scared of no town, no city, no mm-hmm. spotlight, gonna stand in the front. That's who I that's who I want on my team. Mm. And so if you can conquer that, there's a lot of things you had to go through to get to that point. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Well, I want to take you over mm-hmm. to the screen here and dive into the things that that we love to see you do on the field, the things that that made sense to you. Mm-hmm. Also have a bat here if you need to it, it show us anything, yeah, yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but first, that this is a, a, a baseball uh, reference page, right? Mm-hmm. Ridiculous numbers all over the place. The numbers that this is your page, the numbers that stick out to me is, first of all, we see you early on in your career putting up numbers, mm-hmm. 19, and then we go all the way down to 40, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Uh, the 500 home runs automatically stand out to me. But also, like, the one of one of your very last year, your last year still, we have an OPS plus of 119, still 19% better than league <laughs> average yeah. at age 40. Yeah. I, I guess... The one thing I want to ask you is when you see all these numbers, what what stands out to you or what legacy is it that you've you've wanted to leave? What what is important to you? Well, obviously winning. That's yes. number one. Right. Uh that's where we play the game. Once you get start this part of it, you just want to get your feet wet. Mm. Once you get to three, four years in, now it's time to win. Mm-hmm. Once you get your money. Nothing else matters but winning. Right. Now, if you look at uh, RBIs with men in scoring position, mm-hmm. I don't know if they put that stat on there. This one's not on here right that's, now. That's what but I'm saying. I know, See, that's, they don't, they I know don't, that's important. To- right. See, that's that's important to our generation. Mm-hmm. They don't put that stat on here. They got OPS now. They got, mm-hmm. they got war. They got all yeah. of these things. But the only thing really matters is your own base percentage. Mm-hmm. And, how, and when do you drive in a run? When do you drive right. in a run? And can you drive in a run when the team needed the most? Yeah. And those were the things that mattered to me the most. Now, as a third-place hitter, hmm. I always was under the impression, and my thought, press, my thought process was, I have to make the whole team better. So if I'm leading off an inning, I have to, my own base percentage mm-hmm. has to go up. Mm-hmm. My batting average had to go up. Mm. So I have to be all around. So if that's what is a walk, double, or a home run, I have to do it. Right. So when I played the game, whatever the scoreboard said, I had to be that. Mm. So if we're down by two, I got to be a leadoff man. Right. Now, if we're down by one, I have to be the man. Yeah. And so that's how I, I go about it. And I think that's an important conversation, too, because I think we see it in the game today, yeah. right? It do- because those situations sometimes don't aren't as prioritized, right. we'll see players taking swings out of their ass, like <laughs> it. But but being yeah. down yeah. in the game, it, yeah. but but because, but it's hard to blame the player because that's how they're being paid. It's not, it's not their fault, right? It's not their fault. That's the way they ask to play. Mm-hmm. That's why I said it's not their fault. But I don't have to watch the game, right? But you know what I'm saying? Because I'm not gonna watch it, right? Because yeah. I don't want to watch that, right? Now the the thing is, is that I teach my kids the way I was taught, mm. because that'll play anywhere. So right. you can always say I can do what my dad did, mm-hmm. but I can easily do what they do, right? Because see, now if I was asked to go up there and swing out my ass every time mm. and try to hit a home run, there's no telling how many home runs we would have hit, right? So. But that wouldn't have been fun for me. You wouldn't because, have been the all-around player. No, because you... I would have had a couple hundred strikeout seasons on there mm-hmm. that I wouldn't accept. Mm-hmm. I don't. I, I don't accept that. And by the way, there's no hundred strikeout. No, you're seasons. not going to see it. <laughs> <laughs> you're not going to see it. And that's what's cool yeah. to see too, with someone that has yeah. so much power, right? But so disciplined at yeah. the plate. What? What? I, I didn't even think about asking you this question, yeah. but what, what gave you the discipline that you had? Because that that's one thing that we see nowadays is. A lot of guys with the power don't don't have the discipline yeah. and vice versa. Well, I was kind of forced into it first 
because I went to the Florida Marlins in 93 when they mm -hmm. first became the inaugural season. Mm -hmm. Now I'm the man, face of the team. They're not pitching to me. Mm -hmm. Now my frustration was showing, throwing bats at the dugout, you know, hmm. walking the first, didn't want to do it. <laughs> and we played the San Francisco Giants one day. And I think I walked four times in the game. And I was so pissed because I walked three times the day before. I haven't swung the bat but one time in two days. So I'm pissed. And we so know you want to swing right, the bat. I want to swing the bat. So now I go to the cage because I have to find where my swing is. Mm. So I'm there by myself, working by myself. And I see Barry Barnes and Bobby Barnes walking down. And Bobby Barnes say, what the hell wrong with you? Like that. That's the first thing he said when he saw me. I said, what do you mean? He said, you're getting all upset when they're walking you and this and that. Take the walk. And, and, and let your guys behind you do it. I said, well, that don't get me paid like that. <laughs> so he said, no, it's going to make you a great player, not a mm -hmm. good player. It's going to make you a great player. Mm -hmm. And I said, how? So he explained to me that by walking, basically what you're doing, you're creating a discipline and you're hitting to a box mm -hmm. that you don't go outside of. Mm -hmm. And when they come in that box, don't miss. So your average going to go up. Your RBI is going to go up. Your own base percentage is going to go up, and you're going to make your teammates better. When I heard that, I started doing it, and I stopped throwing my bat and being unhappy about it. Mm. Then I saw the benefit of it hmm. because by me getting on base at a high rate, mm -hmm. driving on a run when they had no choice but to pitch to me, right. I stayed locked in longer. Wow. And I, the driving in the run to me mm -hmm. is, is just as important, too, as, as getting on base because – I think we put less value on guys that do a great job with mm -hmm. runners in scoring position. Like right. the RBI for some reason is is devalued a little bit because we feel like guys don't have control over whether they're in RBI situations. Right. But we all know those players that come up clutch when guys are not on base, but then all or they come up big with guys are not on base. But when guys are on base, it's like, wait a minute, what happened to this guy? Yeah. And but, I think there I think there's value to that. Yeah, but all the saving metric guys, right? Mm-hmm. They got this way they want to play the game. Are they going to be mad and upset if they drove in six runs with RBI singles and they're not going to celebrate the World Series that they won <laughs> because they didn't get right. four home runs? Right, yes. So yeah. th it's a contradiction there. Hmm. I'm not saying that it's not needed. Right, right. I'm saying putting this in the in right perspective. perspective. Yeah. Okay? Mm -hmm. Incorporate old school with the new school and make it right, magic. Right. And so they don't want to do that. They just want to be the smartest man in the room. Right. Which this is this is baseball. Mm -hmm. That stuff is not baseball yeah. because it is one dimension. That's simulation. Simulation. And it's like I'm gonna go find the biggest guy to hit the ball the farthest. Yeah. But when I need him the most, he can't do none of this. Yeah. Well, that's why these numbers in your career stick mm -hmm. out even more nowadays because guys ain't. Guys, it's less and less of guys doing that. Right. And I think that's what's special about it. And yeah. I, well, I know we'll put up a bigger board for people to see, so they'll <laughs> see this, but all, all types of accolades and everything. Um, man, this, this year that you a, – a thousand OP, a yeah. thousand ninety OPS. Yeah. I, I can't even I can't even take that seriously, man. That's, <laughs> I'll, I'm going to move on. I'm going to move on because this is a young Gary Sheffield yeah. who played in the Little League World Series. Yes. And I cover the Little League World Series for ESPN, and mm -hmm. it's my favorite event oh, awesome. of the year. Awesome. Um, and I think there's something cool about – well, I want to know what was, the, what was the process like for you doing that, but then also how did maybe that experience shape the rest of kind of your baseball career? And I got a, I got a video here I want to play too. Oh, okay. We got, we, got, uh, we got you in there Oh, too. yeah. So, so, so a lot of people didn't know the guy that was playing shortstop was Tyrone Griffin. Hmm. The guy was in right field was Derek Bell. Wow. So we had you the had guys, a squad. You no, had we a squad. had a squad. So the guy in center field got drafted by the Dodgers. Okay. You know, so we had guys all over the field that mm. could play. That's all from my neighborhood. Wow. And so when we grew up together, I was the one guy that can do it all. Mm. Whether I can pitch, I can catch, I can play short, I can play anywhere. So what my my coach decided was I had me and Tyrone was fielding ground balls at shortstop. Hmm. A ball went through my legs. So he got mad at me and he said, Tyrone is gonna play shortstop. 
because that was a way to get me to agree to catch mm. because I could do it. Yeah. And we had a guy, Kirk Walker, who pitched in this game threw harder than everybody at the league. And at catcher, if, we, if we, in all honesty, catcher yeah. is probably one of the most important position in the on the little league field too, by far, because of the the pass yeah. balls. Guys by just far. keep going around. And he knew we was going to get to this situation as a mm -hmm. as a eleven year old. I didn't. I I I I wasn't thinking like that. Yeah. I was just thinking I'm just playing and doing something I love. Yeah, having fun. Yeah. So now I get behind the plate. We're playing the best team in the world. Taiwan. Taiwan. And so now, if you look at this game, you wouldn't have saw one ball get past me. <laughs> and so this, these are the things that when I look back at all of this, and Willie Starger came to talk to us before this game, and all of this stuff transformed my life mm -hmm. and my thought process. Huh. Wow, I'm here. Wow. Now that I'm here, Willie Starger, now. He talked to you before the, the Little League World Series yes, game. Yes, yes. Wow. And he said, it's going to be one kid in here to listen. And, and I was that you, kid. And you remember that. I remember that. He said, you know how people say, I want to touch everybody and, and get everybody to come yes. aboard. But he said, but I, I know reality. It may, may be one, one kid that may be listening. And I always, I've been, I've been saying that in my head for all these years. Wow. That Willie Starger told me one kid that may be listening. And that was me. Not, he didn't just talk about baseball. Mm. He talked about marijuana. He talked about drugs. He talked mm. about all of it. Wow. And so I was that kid. Didn't do none of it. Mm -hmm. And that was me. It's, it's crazy. <laughs> that, no, I mean, but that's the difference, too. Mm -hmm. A lot of times as a young young kid, like if you take something really and listen to what somebody's saying right. and find a way to apply it, because yep. some of guys may be listening to certain people speak, but if right. you unless you actually apply it, that's yep. not going to do nothing for you. But, but the key to what he said of all the things he said, that don't mean there ain't going to be no pitfalls. Mm. That, ain't, that don't mean you ain't going to go through struggles. Now, can you be that guy that I just described that don't do drugs, don't do all of these things when it ain't going your way? Wow. That's going to make you more powerful. Hmm. And I always remember that. When I'm going through my toughest times, I either eat a sandwich and take a nap. <laughs> eat a sandwich, take a nap. And that's how I, I, that's how I go about it. Yeah. I don't stress about it. Right. I don't elaborate about it. Because you know I, the times, there's going to be tough times coming. It's going it's to leave. Yeah. So I go eat a sandwich and I lay down. <laughs> that, hey, that's great <laughs> advice for it. I mean, I feel like that you, because of certain things yeah. that you just, you can't control. You can't control it. And I love, yeah. shout out to Willie Stargell for even, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. being able to speak on that yeah. to, to 11 year olds. Yeah. And one thing I wanted to highlight, this is you hitting in the cage mm -hmm. with Jazz Chisholm. Mm -hmm. And this is a um, this is a TikTok. I don't even know if you oh, know yeah. about TikTok. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't. <laughs> no, My kids but... tell me everything. <laughs> no, but I feel like we've seen you be able to help young athletes in the game yeah. a lot. Yes. And I, I want to know what is your focus when you're trying to help young athletes? What were you might have been talking to Jazz Chisholm here, but what, what else are, do you want to get across to young athletes specifically? Well, the drill I'm working on right here, it seems like some simple soft mm -hmm. talks. Right. But see... I don't look at soft toss and take it lightly. Mm. I look at if I throw you a soft toss and it's not a strike, where are you swinging at it? We can talk mechanics all day. Right. But if you're swinging at a ball, mm. if you can't train yourself to swing at strikes when I'm tossing it to you, mm. what make you gonna do it? What make you think you're gonna do it in the game? Right. So whatever, when we step in here, this is our game. Mm -hmm. So when the game start, that's the easy part. This is the hard part. Mm -hmm. I want your undivided attention. I'm going to be my authentic self mm -hmm. to you because now when I come at them, they look at me like I can see. they like, whoa. Because if you're going to have me in here. Yeah, the time. I want your undivided. Yeah. And I want your focus, and we're going to perfect this thing. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I told Jazz on this session, I need to see more of you because, see, what, what's going to happen is once my DNA get in you <laughs> – they're they going to see a totally different player. Because mm. I look at his hands. Mm. He's handsy. Yeah, he, he is. He got hands. Yeah. And what Jazz got to learn over time, and he will learn how good he really is. Hmm. He will learn that. Yeah, that's yeah. good. That's good. And, and I guess even for your own sons, that yeah. all, all doing yeah. what they doing, like yeah. what, what's, I get, what's most important for them to know uh, physically – at the plate and then also mentally right now yeah. with the stages that they're at. If you're 5'11", 
my other son is six one. My mm. other was my youngest is five eleven and a half, and then I have one that's six foot, and I have a, a one that's shorter than that. Mm. They playing baseball. That's your stature. Mm. God gave you that. Mm -hmm. That guy that's six four, that people drool at. Oh, you know he's this and that, and right. he's going to grow into this. I tell him all the time. There was this guy named Tino Martinez, was six feet tall. Mm. I think he was six feet tall at twelve years old. And I told him I was hunting him down because I wanted to show him I was the man in town. Mm. Okay? So stop letting all these big kids, overwhelming size, right. make you feel like you less than. Yeah. Now, if you learn the details and you learn how to play correctly, mm -hmm. you'll pass these guys. Right. You can't tell me Jazz Chisel can't hit 30 to 40 home runs. Mm -hmm. If he controlled the strike zone, hmm. you cannot tell me he can't. Right. Because I've seen this man hit balls where six, five guys hit it. Right. Yeah. What what we have to do with Jazz is, and I tell my kids the same thing. What you have to do is control the controllable. Mm -hmm. And that's if they pitch to you. Right. And if they throw you a strike, control that. Yeah. I think that's one. Always a focus is who the bigger players are, mm -hmm. who the mm -hmm. ones that. M muscular, yeah. athletic looking mm -hmm. dudes, but I think there's a good message in there that, that goes a couple of ways is if you if you have your stature, you have your stature, right. keep working. It's not That's like it. you're, if you, your stature chain, you're going to mm -hmm. stop working. Right. So you're always working. And then even to the bigger players, or yep. maybe who have an advanced stature, yeah. you can't stop working either because no. those same ones that may be different are coming yeah, we're for We're coming you. because see now what it looked like on Tuesday is going to look different on Thursday. Right. So I always tell my son that. I wasn't the biggest guy, mm -hmm. but I always knew I can do anything on the baseball field because that's why it was so funny. We were just talking about this with Bob Nightingale. Uh, he had asked me about when I won the World Series. Mm -hmm. What did Jim Leland say? I said he said something to me that no other manager ever said. Hmm. What did he say? Nothing. He said to me that you, I want this, I want you to do this. I want you to put up any time we play Barry Bonds, any great player, mm. any the best player on the team, I want you to outplay him. Wow. That Pacific day. Wow. So we go to another town and play another guy. That's the man on their team. We need you to outplay him. Mm. So what that did to me, I said, cool. Because now you know that I'm that guy. Mm -hmm. But I've never been asked to do that. Right. So now, when I face Barry Bonds, go look at the stats when I face Barry Bonds. Go those, look at the those stats. Those specific games. Go find the best players in the game. Hmm. Look at what I do when I play against them. Wow. Your game elevated. Yes. Because that, I was had it, to. It was, a, it was a confidence. Like, hey, he, he knows I'm the guy. Yeah. He asked me to do it. I know I can do it. Yes. And, and, and there's plenty of times, boom, Barry hit a home run. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's great because I knew he would, but you know this is a series. Right. I yeah. gotta outplay you on this series. Right. Yeah. So now you got me that day. Come I'm getting tomorrow. you tomorrow. Yeah. And then I'm gonna get you the next day. And then when it's all said and done, we walk away to the championship. Barry Bonds is going home, right. and so was a lot of other guys. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's so good. That's so good. <laughs> I love that because it's a. Because there's great players always have a mentality yeah. that a lot of other people don't have, and right. I think that's something that you just don't hear a lot of times. and Because the manager don't understand the player. Mm -hmm. See, that's one thing Jim Leland understood right away with me because he wasn't being fake and phony, and neither was I. Mm -hmm. That's how he was able to know me so well because now he know what, what he had. Right. So now he said, this is my guy. Hmm. So we, we going to use him like a toy to get to where we need to get to. Right. And I, but he was real with me. If I went, if I if I missed an 88 mile an hour fastball down the middle and swung through it, he would put me on the bench the next day, and say you need some rest. And I said no, Skip, I'm fine. He was like, well, you let the guy throw 88 <laughs> miles an hour by you. But that's how that was our relationship. Right. He understood. He understood. Yeah. And he knew I wasn't taking myself out the lineup. He policed me. Mm. You know, he kept me from you know doing things to myself because I'll play through anything. Right. But he had to regulate that. Okay, next thing I got, just a, a random slow-mo, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you with the Detroit Tigers. Yes. I wanted to kind of get from you, because everybody loves the – everybody loves the – Oh, yeah. Right? <laughs> and I think 
And yeah. I'm, I'm a th I think my biggest question would be, where did that foundation even start? Because mm -hmm. well, you don't see players doing it. Right. But what what was like, okay, I need to start doing this, or who yeah. he helped you to start doing What happened? Well, I was in rookie ball. This is the first time I ever used the wood bat. Mm. And I used to hit like Julio Franco almost. I used to have my hands here, and hmm. I used to have a little bit of movement, but not, nothing drastic. Hmm. And I, I was so early on fastballs, when I got the wood bat in my hand, because self-consciously, I knew I, I had a wood bat in my hand. So and I didn't want to get jammed. to get it out. <laughs> you know what I mean? I didn't want to get jammed. I know that feeling, yeah, too. Yeah, so, so I'm My thumb's already hurt yeah. thinking about that. Right. Yeah. So I didn't, like, in high school, I always stayed back and meet the ball. So that's why I had the production I had with the home run. Mm -hmm. But when I got there, I was saying, man, these guys throwing hard. I got to get out there because I don't want to get jammed. Mm -hmm. Now, I cost myself five home runs the first two days. Mm. And, and and the first game two first two days <laughs> and that didn't that didn't sit well with me because I had no home runs because you knew these certain pitches you you should have been hitting out yes and I'm sitting here with no home runs the first two days I didn't do that in high school not once <laughs> you know so it was like that statement it's, within itself yeah. is just wild yeah but, the first but, two days of, of yeah, pro ball yeah but just think about my my, my thought process yeah. I thought everything I did in high school was just that's just normal for me, right, right? I'm supposed to That's do this wherever know. I go. Yeah. Uh, wherever I go. So I get there and then I get in batting practice and I was saying, okay, they was t saying, you know, just just take some balls to right center, hit some balls out. So I just started doing this with the bat. I was getting a stick in my hand and I just started doing this. Mm. And it felt good when I was doing that. I was like, whoa. So I got in there and I started hitting balls to right field. And I was just hitting the bottom of the fence, mm. bottom of the fence. And then I said, okay, he said, uh, now let it go. So now I start wiggling it. I had it down here first. Mm -hmm. Then I got it up a little bit. But when I first started, I had it down here. Hmm. And I was just trying to get up under the ball, and I hit 10 balls out in a row. Mm -hmm. And I said, whoa. <laughs> you know, I, you surprised yourself. I surprised myself because I didn't think I was going to pick it up that fast. It was a natural movement for me. Huh. That's what I found out because I always was handsy and yeah. keep things in my fingers. But I would wait for a long time because I always had strong legs, big legs, and I use them. But now I got this incorporated, I can even slow it down even more. Wow. And when I did that, I wound up hitting two home runs in the game, and that was it. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, was there any, ever any concern about not being able – because when I think about the swing and you going this way so mm -hmm. much, but was there ever any concern that you weren't going to be able to get it back going back this way to get in that slot? Think about it. I'm 18, 19 years old. My 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 arrogance was so high that I yeah. didn't think a human can even do nothing with me. That's just the way young kids right, think. Right, right, yeah. My confidence is so high. The like, old, I ain't gonna get beat anyway. Yeah, ain't nothing you can do to me. Mm. So that's that's how I thought. Now when I get to the big leagues, they tried to change it. Mm. So now they made me doubt my own confidence. Hmm. Because I'm doing something I'm not comfortable they, trying to the, do. When you say they try to change it, they they try to stop you from doing yes. th that? If you look at a couple of my at-bats and you look at a couple cars, you'll see my bat was flat. Mm. They wanted me to flatten the bat out and hit the ball to right center when I just hit 44 home runs in the minor leagues. Mm. Now, I'm, once again, those thoughts, yeah. like I just told you, right, yeah. when authority you know, tells me, we want you to do something else, right? And it ain't benefiting me. Mm. Now, what do I do? Do I listen to them, or do I be rebellious and do what I want to do? Right. Now, that was the decision I had to make. Now, that me doing what they wanted me to do, they was getting ready to send me back to the minors. Ah. And so, when I heard that, that's when the rebellion side came. No, mm. if I get sent to the minors, it's, it's be going to be because of me. Of me. Yeah. And when I did that. I wound up leading the Milwaukee Brewers and hitting that year. Mm. That's that is important for people to know because if you plan, like that was one thing for me. It was like, okay, if I'm gonna lose, mm -hmm. if I'm a if if I'm gonna be done, yeah. or if this this isn't for me, yeah. I'm gonna find out my way. Yes. And I think that's to me, that's one of the separators too, is like being yeah. able to go all in yeah. on what you've already developed for yourself and but, trust but, it. But here's the thing that what you're saying is. That's a fine line that you have to, these, mm. when we say this to kids, we got to be careful. Right, yeah. Because 
are you having success right. doing it the way you're doing it? Right, yeah. Now, if you're not having success, somebody might be trying to help you mm -hmm. and fine tune what you already have. Right. Now, when somebody take you away from, from your success and get you do something totally different, right. then that's when you have to say, hold on. I'm too far left mm -hmm. of what I used to do. Right. Let's take what I do and fine tune it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what I say. Yeah. Like with jazz and all of these right. guys. Right. I find I don't change anything. I fine tune what you have and say, where are you looking when the pitcher throw? Mm -hmm. Where are you looking? How how do you see the field? Mm -hmm. So your eyes are in the wrong place while you're hitting. Mm -hmm. Now it ain't allowing your hands to work because you're looking in the wrong location mm -hmm. and you're letting the ball get on you a little quicker if you was instead of looking where I'm telling you to look and you'll see it a lot sooner. Mm. So it's little things like that. Little, little details that little details maybe some, like that. a player yes. hasn't quite picked up on. Right, because see, they're picking up the ball too late. Mm. I teach guys how to pick up, pick up the ball as soon as it, it leaves his hand. Get so it, now I make, time. my decision is made as soon as it leaves his hand. Mm. Yours is made halfway. Yeah. And if, and if you're making a decision halfway, you're done. It's too late. It's too – you're done. Because, see, I know this, this. I, I pick up every movement in your hand mm -hmm. before you throw the ball. Because why? Because I was paying attention in the dugout. I was paying yeah. attention on the on deck circle. So by the time I stepped on at the plate, I already had you figured out. Mm. You already taking the mental at-bats. Yes. Taking them. Because I know if you do this, it's going to be in a certain location. If mm. you do this, it's going to be in a certain location. So whatever you did here, I already knew to go to that location. Mm. Let me ask you this. When you were hitting, was there a certain spot that you looked for? Because mm -hmm. certain guys look different, right? I'm looking middle away. I'm right. looking middle in. For me, I felt like middle away was a good spot for me. But then later on in my career, I felt like, yo, I'm getting beat inside. I need to, need to get the hands in. Mm -hmm. Was there a certain thought process that you had as like a foundation from right. a mental standpoint. I look down a lane. So the, what I mean by that, if you got a square here, mm -hmm. so my lane is my my top of my chest straight to the 385, the 360, or whatever it is, right field. Mm -hmm. That's my lane. Okay. Okay. So I hit to that lane. But if you come inside, basically you're telling me to hit a home run. So I'm a hitter to this lane. Your focus is straight opposite field, yes. that, that, that lane that yes. you're talking about. That's the lane. The gap, basically. Right. Now, I draw an imaginary box. So I have a couple things going on in my head in milliseconds. Hmm. So when the crowd is going crazy, the base is loaded, and you're coming up, my brain works in milliseconds. Like, boom, I already go to my keys. Hmm. Angle, box. I forgot the crowd. Mm. Swing at strikes. So the crowd is going crazy, but I'm not even paying attention to that. I'm just you paying attention in on to the your strike, keys. The keys. And then once it's over, how many how, how long on that bat last sometimes? You know what? It don't even last a minute, yeah, right? Yeah. So you can't focus in for a minute. Mm -hmm. You see? Mm -hmm. So now when I get to let my brain relax, is when I'm running to my position. Hmm. When I'm playing catch. Right. But when I'm in here. My brain is working. efficient at all times, and even when I don't feel like it. So I go to my keys. Mm -hmm. That's okay. So let me ask you this: When your keys was off, or mm -hmm. when you was off yeah. a little bit, yeah. What adjustments did you feel like you had to make the most throughout yeah. in your career? Get more aggressive, mm. because see now I can't figure out what's a strike and what's a ball. I'm off. Mm. You know, playing the game long as we play and the many days and hours we out there, you can get off yes. and don't know why. Right. But I turn that into aggression. Hmm. So whatever I can most, figure I out. I feel like most guys yeah. will turn that into passiveness. Passiveness. Yeah. I turn it into aggression. So if I, so what if I swing at a bad pitch? I wasn't going to hit it anyway because I'm lost. <laughs> you see? So it's, it's what you tell yourself Mindset, and yeah. how you think will get you out of a lot of trouble. Even days when I didn't think that I was going to do anything. Wow. I was like, man, this is going to be a rough day. I wound up going deep twice because I, I convinced myself I'm the man. I'm, right. I'm going to do this. I got to do this. And the day we – I remember it was a game in Pittsburgh, and it was raining, and it was cold. Hmm. And I was like, man, I was complaining. I was like, man, who wants to play in this garbage? Nobody want to play in this mess. I don't blame you. You know, nobody want to play in this mess. And I wound up hitting two home runs and driving in seven. 
And th- from that day forward, I said I would never complain again. Wow. About anything. Because you don't know, you don't know how your outcome. blessing is going to come. You don't know your outcome. Mm. Just go through it. They got to play in it. You got to play in it. Mm. Go out there and get it done. Wow. Yeah. That's good. That's good. I mean, it don't get <laughs> it don't get much better than that. Like that's yeah. to me that's that's important. Yeah. Okay, I, I got number 500. Mm-hmm. Like when I first pulled up 500 again, I like the score, I looked at the score, you yeah. was down one run, yes. you pinch hit, yeah. it's late in the game, it's a 3-2 count. Like, a lot of times we don't even think about that. Right. And I think the situation is just as, it, it tells me a lot about the hitter that you were. Right. It didn't matter what, what the situation was, you was going to get the job done. Yes. And I think that's what stuck out to me. Mm-hmm. What, what do you think of when you see 500? Well, this particular day, my mom and dad had just left because it took me so long to do it. Mm. And I told him to go home. I'm going to get it done. (laughs) But this particular game, for some reason, I was locked in. I didn't even know we was playing Milwaukee Brewers, to be honest with you. And I'm saying to myself, this is the first team I I got drafted by. Right. But I wasn't even thinking like that. Six inning, I'm down in the cage hitting because I knew my time was coming. Mm. And all of a sudden, I come out on the bench sweating, and Jerry Manuel see me, and he said, you going in and hit. I go in the hit. I didn't even know the score was four to three. <laughs> I didn't even know. I'm I'm just locked dialed in, right? Because I wanted to get in the starting lineup mm. every day, right? So now when I go out here and the at bat started, it was a long at bat. Mm-hmm. He was throwing me some good pitches, mm. and I was fouling it off. But this, when I did that right there, when I dropped back like that, let me bring it back. Let me bring yeah. it back. So it's that that one area. So now. I had everything in sync. I had them fought off pitches away, away, away. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, he has to throw a strike because there's no outs. Because I'm being that leadoff guy. Like I told you, I played to the scoreboard. But if you come inside, Mm -hmm. you're basically telling me to hit a home run. So I had all my cues down Mm -hmm. because I was focused. Mm -hmm. And all my keys was in place. And next thing you know, he's just trying to throw a strike right here. And once he threw that ball... Once I get that the hips around, yeah. it's over. <laughs> and so when I hit it, that's when I was relieved. Mm. My, that that moment, not when the ball land, when I hit it, I thought about 22 years in a millisecond. Wow. And say it's over. I don't care what else I do. I don't care if they vote me anything, yeah. do anything. I've accomplished what I wanted to accomplish. Wow. What, and was... I can't even imagine the the pressure of 500. Mm-hmm. Was it, was it, how did it, what was the emotions that came along with that, that weight? Was yeah. it like, I got to get this done? Mm-hmm. Like, was it like, let me, let me try to hit a home run? What yeah. was, what were you thinking games leading up to that while yeah. you're trying to get to 500? Well, I'm not the most patient person in the world. Now you would probably say different because I walked a lot. Right. Yeah. But. That's not what I want to do. I have to really be mentally strong to do that. Mm -hmm. Now, in this situation, it's easy for me to hit a home run. It's it's nothing for me to say, I'm going to go up here and try to hit a one home run. Yes. But but what I'm saying to you, not to be disrespectful. No, I know. I'm saying it from a standpoint. I'm laughing because with some of the things that you're telling me, it's like, it's not how people think. You right. know what I'm saying? Right. But that's what sep- that's what separates you. Right. So so it's easy for me to go out here and hit a home run. But I've been trained to be disciplined mm. as a hitter to do what it takes to win. Mm. So I didn't think like that. Right. So right. now I'm in this position. Oh, I look up. I didn't even realize the game was four to three until my probably my sixth pitch. Mm. I was just trying to get on base. And then when I looked up at the board, and I was like, oh, this is a one-run game. And as you saw my bat, it got more aggressive and more aggressive and more aggressive. Mm. And I said, go to your keys. And when I went to my keys, because that's my safety blanket. Right. And I locked in. And next thing you know, he comes in there, and I just reacted. <laughs> uh, but I love how it comes back to the keys, too, yeah. right? The, yeah. The safety blanket, even at that age, yeah. it was all there was always something that you could come back to. Yeah. And I and I know as a player, that's not easy to do no, all the not. time. It's not. And especially yeah. you you got some weight on your shoulders. You like you said, you're trying to prove you should be yeah. in there every day. Yeah. You're trying to hit 500 like that. That to me is impressive within itself. Well, yeah, because 
If kids can learn how to come to work, be accountable to their teammates, mm -hmm. organization, mm -hmm. despite their disagreements with organizations, with something maybe going on with your family or anything, if you can tune all that out and focus on your guys, hmm. you know, yeah. when they relying on you, that's the ultimate goal and that's the ultimate prize. Mm. I love that. I love that. That uh, that me that that's impressive to hear. And I think I always kind of end it with like a piece of advice that you would give young players. Mm -hmm. I feel like you've done a great job yeah. of giving those piece of advice. I guess if there was, what's the number one thing that you telling your kids as they going through right. their own journey? Because I think that's something that will resonate with young players in the game today, young young players in other sports, mm -hmm. young people in general. What's mm -hmm. something that you took away from your career that you want other people to know? Two things. I always tell my kids, just because your stature is 6'1", 5'11 and a half, 6 feet, that don't mean that's where you're going to be. Mm. So it ain't no different if you went 0 for 3 or 0 for 4. Mm. That means tomorrow I may go 4 for 4. If you think like that now, you're going to be so trained when you get older, it's, it's like it's going to be easy. Mm. So don't worry about other people's stature mm. and their phys physique or mm -hmm. whatever. Don't care about that. Just know that if you go back to your routine, whenever you're in trouble, your routines will save you because that was the hardest work you put in. Mm. The game is supposed to be easy. Mm. So whenever you feel in doubt or in trouble, go back to the work mm -hmm. that you put in in that cage. Wow. Wow. I think it, like for me, that was one of the toughest things to do is mm -hmm. be able to say, okay, stop worrying about Every, mm -hmm. everybody else because right. you always it's always like you care about somebody else's opinion yeah, and yeah. I don't know why that is specifically it, that may be an ego thing yeah. it may be a you know a, a, a discipline type thing but yeah. that's one thing that is so important is like yeah. just focus on what you've done and the mm -hmm. work that you put in and stop caring about so many other people well that's good it's, it's funny you saying that because you needed a teammate to see that. Mm. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. See, I was that guy that observed things. Mm -hmm. And when I saw that in teammates, they would, I would do weird things and they were like, how do you know I was dealing with that? Hmm. See, I would go over there and I would just, I would do like this. Because hmm. I know they're in their deep thoughts. Mm. See, I just snap you out of your deep thoughts. Yeah, yeah. And then you'll look at me and you just forgot about it for a second. <laughs> You see? Right. And I say, now nah, you're good? Yeah. Yeah, I'm yeah. good. So you ain't think about it no more. <laughs> you like, get out your own head. <laughs> That's it. That's it. I love it. that. I love that. Yeah. Gary Sheffield, I appreciate you coming through. All right, baby, you got it. Thank you. Absolutely. And, uh, we'll have to do it again. Absolutely.